Welcome to another episode on Catalyzing Radical Systemic Change, where it's all about discovering, mapping, and cross-pollinating what I think are the necessary building blocks towards a planetary civilization ahead. And today's topic is very dear to my heart. Uh, the topic is collective trauma healing. And when I personally sense back into my own biography from the very early childhood, for whatever reason, I did not only perceive personal trauma through a very early childhood accident, but I was pretty much haunted by uh, the collective um, trauma, I'd say, of uh, war, genocide, and environmental destruction. So I personally was a very cerebral, uh, not very funny child, wild, but at the same time, always figuring out already, yeah, from very, very early childhood on, what is this mess we are collectively creating on this beautiful gem of a planet called Earth. So with that, uh, I end my own uh, two cents on the topic. And uh, I feel very grateful to be today in this virtual room together with uh, Kosha. Kosha is the CEO of the Pocket Project. And my first question for you today, Kosha, is when you look back into your own biography, and usually we have this couple of defining pivotal points. Um, please give us a sense of when this topic showed up in your life and how you try to respond to it. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, Alistair, and lovely to be here with you. Also for this topic, transformation and global shift, um, very close to my heart. Well, I was born in South Africa and you know, many strands came together in that. Um, there was a, a sexual abuse that took place very early in my life, but that I actually forgot because I was so young. So it led to many symptoms throughout my life, but I, it took me 40 years or let's say 37 years from a three and a half year old to a 40 year old to actually suddenly have the memories come back. And so that was a big part of my life story and a big, very interesting, adventurous exploration and it's ongoing. So I'm 54 now and I've done 14 years of very precise integration work on this topic. And I think any work we do in this area is really falls on the foundation of the deepest experiences that our nervous systems have made as very small children, babies, when the nervous system is very sensitive still and not so able to um, process intense energies. So that's one strand that I usually don't speak about. More public is the fact that I grew up in South Africa under apartheid. And the apartheid system, this was, I was born in 68, so this was really the 70s. And um, Nelson Mandela was already very active and the armed arm of the ANC was planning for more attacks, also violent attacks on Konto Wasiswa because they saw that the system wasn't going to be shifted shifting just through peaceful means. So at least some kind of showing, you know, we're here um, seemed important, but that was felt, I think, by in the society and definitely in my system as a threat. You know, what was clear is that I was living in a system that was deeply unjust and I could see it, even though it was very hidden I grew up in a system of indoctrination, you could say. So very hidden, but it was palpable 
you could taste it. I could taste it as a child that this was not right. And it was simple events in my life where I saw, for instance, an accident and I knew white people would never be transported in that way. This would never have happened, you know, moments like that or seeing a mother and a child begging on the street and just knowing, you know, even as a very six year old, it was visible. And I started speaking out against it as a seven year old, you know, quite young in my family, in my school and experienced the the backlash, you know, of a system feeling under threat, wanting to protect itself and then people speaking out against it. Um, yeah, and I saw the effect that it had, you know, in I could only in a way imagine the effect that it had on all the other groups in South Africa. You know, I could I experienced the effect it had on the white group. And I had so I grew up with a deep sense of guilt and shame also towards yeah my own culture my own people and i as a teenager i became more radicalized i joined the anc at some point not officially i worked with the anc i joined anti-apartheid movements i was in amsterdam by this time and i co-organized a big conference um, for women from south africa to come and to build a women's movement across South Africa. And that was another big turning point in my life where I realized I had been studying at that time and cultural anthropology and linguistics, because at that time there was no intercultural peace building studies. So that was the best I could do, the best I could think of. Um, and at that conference, I realized that I was not learning what I needed to learn at university, that it was fantastic. I'd learned a lot about the capitalist global system and neo-colonialism. It, it was amazing. It brought me to the understanding that actually the racism and systems of oppression um, and neo-colonialism I was witnessing in South Africa was actually a global issue. And that countries like Holland or like are just as much involved in much more subtle ways, but that it was truly a global um, situation. And yeah, and that brought me to a very radical change in my life where I realized I'm not going to learn what I need to learn on the mental level only. And I changed my life. I went on a pilgrimage through South Africa where I just, this was 1990, 1991, six months, and I just walked through the country. So it was just after Nelson Mandela had been released or in that period, and the violence was at an all-time high across the country. And somehow, I, I can't even say that I was courageous. It was as if I had no other choice but to find out what I needed to find out on the ground by walking and by meeting my country and my people. And I had an amazing experience of, yeah, I guess one of the most extraordinary experiences that I had was that I, I often felt more protected by the dark skinned people that I met than by the white skinned people because I was such an a normal phenomenon, a young white Afrikaner woman walking with, you know, in the end, like I was mainly walking with very little money. So hardly any money, you know, just and just sleeping outside on the beach usually. Um, and it was like just something that fell out of the society so deeply that the the way that women are so called protected in the white society didn't fit 
Yeah, so it really also shifted a lot in my understanding of where violence lives in the society. <laughs> and it shifted my whole connection to the universe, literally, because I, I dropped out of all safety nets, um, especially the safety net of um, security through money, security through um, following the main pathways that society opens to you and it allowed me to come home to the land. Um, I had a deeper connection to the stars, to the sky, to the sea, to the plants that were growing and for some reason the beauty of nature and the depth of nature gave me a solace and a healing that was not forthcoming anywhere else. And the other thing was that my movement through life, I started to come back to my own rhythm. I started following my own intuition again. Who do I speak to? Who do I not speak to? How do I find my path through a black township where I'm not really allowed to be or you know, I'm told it's extremely dangerous to be or, you know, I was walking through all the parts of the country that I wasn't allowed to go to as a child. So it was this ah deep liberation, I feel, as I speak now from some of the cultural agreements that make our lives very small that happened to me. Yeah, and from that, I actually ended up in a community where black and white people live together. And that was my initiation into the community movement. And I decided, OK, I thought I wanted to change the world through science, learning about cultural communication and or through politics, activism. Now Nelson Mandela is released. I know apartheid is over. Um, I don't feel that pure science is calling me. But this I understand. Building regenerative communities that are become like a healing impulse in their environment and grow the new culture that we're searching for bottom up without fighting the old system, I understand it. And I feel that even the healing processes that were happening, the restoration processes, the acknowledgement processes that were happening in community between black and white people, um, you know, they were hopefully on a par with the Truth and Reconciliation Committee work. But if I see where South Africa is today, I see that this work has not yet been done of actually um, the subtlety of the deep um, nervous system interchange, acknowledgement, melting the ice so that true solutions can arise. And um, yeah, it leads to a continuation of a lot of violence in my home country, South Africa. Yeah, so working just to, you know, I know I'm speaking a long time, um, but basically my work with the Global Ecovillage Network took up the next 30 years of my life, literally until 2020, um, building community, traveling through communities, learning about community, um, then going very deeply into communication, the social, what is collective wisdom, how can we in communities move to the highest possible common denominator instead of the lowest? Um, those questions really became drivers in my life. And I ended up as the CEO of the Global Ecovillage Network for quite a while. I worked for 15 years full time in the organization and um, yeah, supported the African Ecovillage Network to grow. So I had a lot of possibility to bring my longing for healing into a shape in the world, while at the same time understanding that this is something we can only do with 
So I can help support building supportive structures for this, but I'm not doing the work. Anyone who's creating healing community anywhere in the world is doing the actual work. And, you know, we've grown to a place where we were able to acknowledge and relate to over 6,000 communities in the world that were actually doing this healing work. And that was the number like one, two years ago. It takes a lot of research to be able to prove it and have the addresses and the email addresses of people, which is becomes impossible when you move to the north of Senegal or, you know, Cameroon or anywhere. But we literally um, built this global network on all continents with equal um, presence in the board, in the global assembly, etc. So lots of space for intercultural exchange. And in this journey, what I came to realize is that all of these big communities, some of them very old, like now I live in the Finthorn community in Scotland, which was founded 60 years ago this year. Um, so 62, I believe that makes it. Um, yeah, and I experienced that all of these communities seem to have a similar trajectory where there's a very strong healing impulse, which creates a lot of transformation and growth and people come and are completely transformed. And it is, is a very, very strong motor for transformation and change and upgrading to what feels like a healing way of growing food, of interacting, of being with nature, of growing alternative economic approaches, culture, bringing in forms of spirituality that are inclusive. And, and then it feels like it stops. It's as if communities reach a ceiling. Even though there's a lot of psychological capacity and skill and I came over time and even sometimes the founders or a lot of the early people go to the outskirts of the community to continue very vibrant and creative work. Starting new startups or networks, which is wonderful and it's like a natural way of, you know, growing a structure, but it was also clear that the structure itself was not upgrading itself any longer and a lot of visitors come more and more. And they go through a similar transformation process, but the whole system doesn't continue evolving. And I started realizing that this is where we hit the edges of collective trauma. And I, because now um, yeah. I have quite some questions. It, it's for the first time that you're using the terminology of collective trauma. And since you were sketching from your early childhood to adolescence to, let's say, two years ago, your biography, I wonder when were the defining moments in your life where you were able, if not to use the terminology, then at least, you know, have a felt recognition of this is like, for the lack of a better word, like a a cluster of emotions or a cluster of things happening on the outside that make you recognize it's not only that there's the things not quite right it's actually really a very entangled very dense energy in the room in the organization uh, in the community and since you were mentioning it for the first time uh, during your time, you know, these many years at uh, Global Eco Village Network, I wonder when you sense back, when you recognize like other defining moments. Mm. And maybe the last question, because I find it kind of very interesting that you come to rec came to the recognition with Global Eco Village Network is because I personally feel there's many good things that are happening in these communities, all whilst, this might be a very personal note, we won't save the planet with global eco-villages. Um, and there's no way back. 
you know, so for some, the lucky few, you know, there, there will be rural life and community life. But when I look at, I don't know, 50% of the world's uh, uh, population, you know, moving into like mega cities in the, yeah, basically from now in the next 10 to 20 years, um, I wonder what of these collective trauma um, symptoms maybe you could extrapolate uh, beyond the notion of uh, you recognizing them in, in eco-villages. Yeah, so, you know, I do think that the first thing to, that I named was uh, this, the, the perception that I had as a child of injustice and also a threat building that was very clearly palpable in the country. And I think that's an important pointer. You know, I had regular nightmares also about that as a child, that children are very perceptive to collective fields and that we know that about our children and about children in general. And that's definitely, I couldn't frame it, but I knew it and I did speak to it also. So in a way, there was even an understanding that this was bigger. This was societal in me as a child. And um, <clears throat> jumping to the eco village network, you know, as I it was quite a strong process for me from being a facilitator. So I worked as facilitator in communities around the world um, where I was working mainly with um, expression of authentic self allowing authentic self to arise and co-creation of collective wisdom fields and what are the ingredients to that and there was a time when i was um polarizing collective wisdom with collective stupidity i even wrote a book on collective wisdom in 2010 and i had a chapter on the collective stupidity of groups, organizations, and humanity, you know? And as I wrote that even, I realized that the word stupidity lies so distasteful. It's distasteful in my mouth, you know? That something about it doesn't feel honoring of the depth of suffering that leads to the painful decision making that leads to the current destruction of our planet you know the incapacity to take wise decisions together but also the suffering that comes out of that you know and that there is a a deficiency model of how we look at human beings you know there used to be these jokes i don't know whether people still tell them about oh you know the poor planet earth it has humanity and then another planet coming by and saying, wow, I know that's horrible, but don't worry, it'll pass soon, you know, because it's like as if we're this deficient disease that are on the planet. And I think actually, you know, even as I say it, I can feel that that's how many of us see ourselves, at least in unconscious part. And I think also many young people are you know, we see a, a great lack of self-confidence in young people in the world. So um, there is something about seeing ourselves as something ugly, a deficiency model that has gone very deep into the human psyche, um, which is in itself a trauma symptom, you know, connected to shame and to guilt also. So yeah but what i wanted to say is that holding those processes in community i became aware that it's as if there is a big movements bigger energies much bigger energies coming into the room and pressing onto the room that we're not able to see easily i'll give an one very simple example i remember a time when i was in an eco village called sieben linden in germany and we were an extremely um, ecological community and mostly vegans, vegetarians, and also a few meat eaters, like, you know, permaculturists who were um, wanting to grow their food holistically and therefore also hold animals. 
And this big discussion broke out about how we would have animals in the community and whether killing animals would be accepted or not in the community. And it completely split the community. It was so painful, the conversations, you know, and I could feel that we were touching on collective trauma of genocide, of war, the fear of death, who has the right to decide over the death of who, you know, it was just much bigger fields pushing in. And that in a way we were not able to, it became very difficult to address them directly. We actually did extremely well, I have to say, for a time before the term collective trauma was even around, I would say we did really well. We did deep spaces, we opened up a deep space where people could speak about their relationship to death for a long time. And that actually helped the solution move forward. So, but for me, it was a great relief, I have to say, when Thomas Hubel, who's been a great inspiration in my life, really started speaking explicitly about collective trauma. And it brought a name which functioned so much better than collective stupidity. You know, it's much truer, it's much closer to what is actually taking place in our nervous systems. And I, and I want to name one last thing, which is that the other big experience I've had is in this global network of Jen, that um, coming together with the different cultures, coming together with the different continents, with the historical relations of enslavement, colonialism, and racism, unintegrated, not restored, it became very clear how the sand in the system doesn't enable us to find solutions together easily. I would say we did and we are doing an amazing job in the Global Ecovillage Network. You know, if I look at what happens at the United Nations Climate Conference and the implementation of that, I would, you know, it's hard work. It's, and we cannot address the sand in the system yet. We don't have the words for it. This work is very fresh still. So, um, yeah, so that was the big shift in my life where I decided to shift my work to completely focus on looking at the sand in the system rather than pointing, this is where we want to go, this is where we want to go, which is healing cells. And just the last question that you had was about, you know, rural areas and urban areas and, you know, eco village being for the small part. The other, I feel that the words we used in the Ecovillage network, in the global intentional community network in um, the 90s have now become mainstream. And that's the best way to spread of a movement. You know, we have no idea how many people, you know, and it's also not just, of course, no organization works, no network works by itself. You know, Club of Rome brought out the limits to growth. You know, the Global Ecovillage Network was founded, you know, this, all of this thinking, processing and living brings out all the visitors visiting these places, going back to their organizations and their work, you know, spreading of seeds. So I feel that today um, we need to firstly all of what we w were doing in the 80s and 90s in communities now needs to be mainstreamed and is being mainstreamed in many very interesting ways. And also, we know that we can build vertical gardens, balcony gardens in cities, we can build communities in cities. So the same concepts are just as applicable not in the same way, you know, we bring our updates and our creativity to it, but this is, these are seeds for what needs to happen now in cities and in the countryside. Yeah. I have the feeling I want to get creative together with you. When I look at individual trauma, 
Um, in one of the upcoming podcasts, I will share a conversation with MAP, so the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, um, because um, through actually uh, all the war veterans in the United States um, that are getting like hooked on benzodiazepines and opiates and often they're like severely addicted on uh, alcohol, there are actually some solutions out there which through scientific rigor, we're, we're able to build processes uh, to really help these people individually. So my question into your direction is, I know this is still a new and emerging field, but given the collective challenges at hand, and my very personal notion is that we won't make this at all if we do not take care very profoundly of collective uh, trauma. It's just, it's almost like a knowing, like an intuitive knowing inside. Mm. And I'm also not a guy, although I studied epistemology and uh, sociology and macroeconomics, that's like, um, believes in scientism in the sense that, you know, scientific rigor is the, is the solution to all the challenges. Nevertheless, are there some data points and studies uh, that you could mention where um, we could um, tell people that, for example, disenfranchised communities in some parts of the world show higher uh, symptoms of uh, trauma and also collective trauma? Because I wonder how this uh, gets operationalized, you know, for example, in sociological studies or something the like. Hmm, interesting. So, you know, maybe first to just say a few words about trauma itself and how we work with the concept. So, you know, we would say that trauma, trauma takes place when the nervous system cannot process the intensity of the experience that the person is going through. And what happens then very intelligently is that the nervous system manages to parcel off that intensity into a pocket. You could say that's why our organization is called, you know, the pocket project, healing pockets, addressing pockets of trauma. So parceled off into a pocket, which is pushed out of consciousness in a way. It's frozen. And it stays like that until we, the nervous system and the system around us have enough resources to address that pocket and allow it to melt back into the stream of life. This happens on an individual level. And as I already said, especially as young children, our nervous systems are very vulnerable. Um, it happens as adults. And we are, we were never meant as human beings so in south africa we have the term ubuntu i am because you are we were never meant to process trauma ourselves you know in that part of our nervous systems we had the experience that this is too much for me to process and we were we're actually as humanity we're able our nervous systems are able to resonate with each other and this has been proven scientifically in neuroscience that we have mirror neurons, that there's, for instance, motherese, that a mother and her baby, the nervous system, start co-creating a pattern of communication, which is the basis for all human communication at later stages in life. And, you know, the very simple fact that we haven't cultivated knowledge and education around the fact that I am able to resonate with you, for instance, in this very moment, that my nervous system can become more aware of itself and also more aware of your nervous system. And that actually, as we're having this conversation, we're also starting to come into a rhythm together. You know, it doesn't mean we're not bound. There's a lot of creativity possibly possible from that shared rhythm. You know, it's not a fixed rhythm. It's a very creative rhythm. But 
that's how we can support each other in trauma integration. So if after an accident, somebody is there and is with, and all emergency services know this, you know, the way you speak to the person who's just gone through a deeply shock, shocking experience, whether you have a very soft way of maybe just touching their body, um, helping them to ground, feeling them, acknowledging them can immediately lessen the chance that trauma is frozen. The way that adults are able to be with us as children, you know, we, we get a great fright, we run to the lap of our mum, we jump on it if our mum is just there with us and allows our nervous system to just relax into her nervous system. Ah, <sighs> we come back to ourselves and we can go out and play again, you know, so that's individual trauma. And already you see that it's deeply entangled with the collective. Then we have ancestral trauma, which is um, all the historical trauma where groups of people go through experiences together, like you named the war in your introduction, genocides. So these are huge effects of an intensity that we are not even not able to look at directly. There is a reason why the trauma of colonialism hasn't been restored or the trauma of the Holocaust hasn't been restored because the, the intensity of the pain is of a level that we're not able to integrate, to look at. It would need a bigger collective body to come into resonance to start looking at this, you know. So you already see that, yeah, the collective is needed to work with collective trauma. We cannot do it as individuals. But ancestral trauma is comes through our particular ancestries, like your ancestry, any of the trauma in their life that couldn't be processed is passed on genetically to you. And um, there is also more and more scientific evidence for this at the moment. Um, yeah, and then the final level is collective trauma. So there is more and more research, you know, since the adverse childhood experiences study that was done in the US, there are more and more studies of that kind being done in different countries around the world. How many adverse childhood experiences have children had in this area? Like I know the study of Scotland, I've read it. It's the average is, I believe, four, but it changes from environment to environment. So in Glasgow, it might be higher than in Edinburgh, for instance, you know. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and then it's correlated with the health effects that this has on people. So again, the measurement at the moment is mainly for individual trauma that you can measure. In the epigenetics, they're starting to be able to measure epigenetic um, continuation of trauma. There's just a study that came out, for instance, about babies that were born after the um, Two Towers attack in New York. So that were in the stomach of their mum and um, had um, experienced the fear of the mother in her belly and the effect that that has on certain hormones that there are in their blood. So genetic triggering of hormones, for instance, that is shifted. Um, on the collective level, like if you really look at collective trauma and there is, we're really just starting the work. And I think it's also very interesting because it's, as you say, where sociology and psychology need to start working together. We've just done an, a beautiful piece of research, which is actually going to, you know, the first research is going to come out um, beginning of August 2022, and a full report is going to come out at the end of August 2022. This is um, and will be translated to English. It's actually in German because it was a work that we did on collective trauma integration in Germany. And we worked with um, a software called SenseMaker, which 
works with narratives before, during, after to see how people's perception of their own situation and their own meaning making shifts. Very interesting results so that before the collective trauma integration process, which is may, mainly like, well, I could s say more about that later, but where before um, people self classify their stories as relating to polarization, to fragmentation, to distrust in society, to feeling that society is not performing well at the moment. Um, and also and not wanting to be so involved in society. So this is very much focused on also, you know, how do we how do we activate citizens to feel more agency in democracy to at the end um, experiencing more hope, more focus on understanding the other side less polarization, less fragmentation, etc. So we can actually show that movement in a collective. It's 600 stories coming out of a group of 400 people. So quite an interesting research process. And we want to continue this work around the world. But it's leading edge work, you know. I have the feeling now is the perfect moment, you know, as a segue to really dive into the pocket project. Mm -hmm. Because I reckon the listeners or those who watch the video are now as curious as I myself to really, you know, sense into, okay, we have these huge topics, war in Ukraine, the Holocaust, apartheid. And I think much like you said, what is a possibility to free ourselves as humanity, as to the, you know, dominant species on this planet from this default mold and basically saying, okay, better, you know, uh, our mother organism wipes us out, you know, we don't deserve it. So how does the pocket project work? Where are you standing? Give some examples. Ideally get as palpable as possible with what you're doing actually yeah. on the ground. Yeah, so the pocket project was founded by Thomas Hubel and his wife, Judith Sasportas. And Thomas Hubel has been working on the topic of collective trauma integration processes for the past 20 years. And his wife is a worldwide known artist who, Israeli artist who um, brings also the German Israeli trauma of the Holocaust alive through her art. So using art to work on making visible the unspeakable, that which needs to stay invisible because we cannot process it. So it's like creating softer ways of processing than through words. Um, so art, I think, does play a big role in this. But our, our vision is that we can integrate individual ancestral and collective trauma by turning our attention slowly but surely towards it. And the first step in that is to become aware of the impact of collective trauma. And there I think it's really important that we realize it's the unseen. You know, basically trauma is what we're not conscious of. It's what's absent. So already that's super interesting to focus on what we cannot see. And what we can see of trauma is not nice to look at. Yeah, and it's also been very, um, yeah, it's like, so if you're a veteran who's not able to function in society, if you're the survivor of sexual abuse who's not able to function, there's a huge stigma related to trauma. And also a, a collective trauma around it, which is to be pushed to the edge of society into mental institutions or to end up in the gutter, you know. So 
And just as we speak about the topic, we're touching the collective trauma about collective trauma. So when you bring the word trauma already, you know, many people, I'm not going there. Speak to me about resilience, about regeneration, about resourcing. Don't speak to me about trauma. It's the last thing we need at this time. You know, there's a crisis already. So, you know, we need to work with that. And um, for sure, we can change the language. So I often speak about mental health and wellness instead of trauma or, you know, see what is it that works in your context. But waking up to what we cannot wake up to is, I would say, the next frontier for us as human beings on multiple levels, you know, because so bringing this awareness, building this awareness is the first step of the work that we do. And then the next one is building communities of practice. And I've already spoken about my nervous system being able to feel your nervous system as we speak, which I now need to come back to, because while I speak, I go slightly more into my language brain and I become slightly less embodied. So now I come more fully back to my body, my nervous system, my emotionality. But we, we build these practices of building coherence in myself first, learning how to self-regulate, constant practice to recognize trauma symptoms as they show up in myself and to become able because it goes so fast you know someone hits a trauma in me and my self-protective mechanisms are there they are there for a good reason this is an intelligent response because i needed to protect myself against this experience so i do it again and again and again and again and I can watch the repetitive patterns of trauma symptom <laughs> unfold in my life. And this might be that I always have conflicts in my teams or I'm not able to provide the resourcing that I need for my life or I'm not able to find a life partner or, you know, and I judge myself for it. You know, it's again, so also this moving from a deficiency model to honoring the intelligence in ourselves. So the work really starts here with me. And even this work, we cannot do it alone, because as soon as we hit the places of trauma, we might need co-regulation, you know, to be able to see. Everywhere we can't see ourselves, we might need the help of others to help us to see deeper to help us go to places where we have practiced for 40 years not to go to, right? So the other level on um, the personal practice is what you could call a practice of presence. You know, I would say in our mindfulness, different forms of spirituality, but that your regular enhance and grow your witnessing capacity and the more presence and witnessing capacity you bring to yourself or to any situation in life the more can show up so there's this incredible um, growth of practice which is very speci specific also basic competencies that we train in but they also relate to many competencies that many different traditions and organizations train in. But to, to build that practice, um, that community of practice and make it stronger. And then we can start um, actually addressing fields of trauma that go beyond also the personal. So, you know, doing some ancestral work, looking at how do I relate to my parents, to my grandparents, to my ancestry? Because these are our roots. There's a lot of resourcing that could stream to us through our roots. But because of the traumatization that could also stream to us, we often try to keep it away, you know, which again, it holds us captive in a way. You know, it takes a lot of energy 
to hold things away, to keep them unconscious. So there is a lot of double win, win, win when we do post-traumatic learning. You know, when we become more able to allow the flow of energy through our ancestry to reach us. And yeah, with all of this, we become more and more able to address the collective trauma in our societies and in our world. And I'm not saying that this is a step-by-step -step process. It's completely entangled and we're constantly doing all of these, but it's good to know about them and to know when in doubt, come back to yourself. How is my nervous system doing right now? And when we look at collective trauma, one of the main symptoms of collective trauma is fragmentation of a system, polarization. So I can always see, uh, is my trauma turned on right now by how far away I feel from others and how much I other others? Yeah, so very, <laughs> and we can see how much othering is happening in our. Um, I wonder for those listening in, if you could even get more practical and showcase a couple of examples and give a couple of yeah. names or regions or cities where this is happening. And also like when you talk about communities of practice, how many people, organizations are so far involved with the pocket project. And maybe finally, um, where do you see this going? It's not about biggest beautiful, but I really think this work needs to be done by millions. So let's say, put a random number out there. Let's, let's make it grow to 100,000, uh, you know, uh, groups that regularly practice. And uh, maybe finally, are you aware of any place on the planet where there is no or a lesser uh, extent of collective trauma? Hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> practically, um, as we start this work now, I would say that we come from thousands of years of archaeological layering of collective trauma, and it's become a very thick layer. And we can see exactly the symptoms of that, the expression of that in where the world currently is at. Um, at the same time, through all of those generations, we've also had a lot of learning, traumatic learning also. People have gone through experiences and have been able to integrate it and transform it into wisdom. So we sit here today with both. And it's a high intensity, also a high tension, you could say, around growing awareness and unintegrated trauma. So high tensions in our societies, you know, we see societal movements like the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement are breaking out of that, you know, saying we have to look at this, you know, we're so there's a lot of movement happening around this and um, when we start doing the work, we need to really build those communities of practice. Because when we start doing the work, when we actually start meeting, consciously saying, okay, we're going to come together now as a group to look at a specific field of collective trauma. As soon as we look at it, the force of a collective trauma is on a completely different intensity as individual trauma also for our individual nervous systems. So yeah, maybe I should, I should put that in question marks. <laughs> I, I don't want to say that as a fact, but when we meet, for instance, the Holocaust in a group of Germans and Israeli people, the intensity of that in our nervous systems will be very high. If we're not able to self-regulate, the fragmentation and the polarization that appears in the group will be intense and not easy to host, which is why we don't like going to these places, because we know we can't, we're not yet able to host it. Yeah? So that's why I keep saying the pre-training is so important, you know, but how we work, like 
in 2020 to 2021, we had 23 what we called international labs looking for a year long period at specific areas of trauma. And this was from the trauma of climate change, the trauma of gender violence, the trauma of um, Argentina, the trauma of Mexico, the trauma of the Holocaust, you know. So different thematic and geographic topics. And we went through a nine month specific process of building coherence in the group, growing the capacity of um, the community of practice, actually looking at some of the historical facts and the historical landscape that we're speaking to. How did this um, shape me as an individual? How did this touch my life? How did it touch the culture that I grew up in? You know, how did it touch my ancestors? And how does that come home to me? And then, you know, conscious space of listening to the voices of the deep lake, coming closer and closer to the actual naming of the collective trauma. And that's where you come, you slowly start melting the ice with the acknowledgement of the actual transgression of sacred law that took place. And that takes a lot. It it's a strong emotional work for the victims. And for the perpetrators, it's often even harder to get there. Because yeah, Thomas sometimes says that there's a grace on the victims through the pain and the suffering, the nervous system is kept in movement. But in the perpetrators, the icing is in a way very rigid. And there needs to be a conscious decision in all of us, especially those of us who come from the privileged populations and part of the world who've been part of the perpetration of colonialism, enslavement and racism or of gender violence. You know, we need to really take a conscious step. This is not and be willing to look at those parts in ourselves. You know, we're all more attracted to look at the victim parts in ourselves than the perpetrator parts, you know. So this is strong work. And then we can start melting a little bit of ice at a time. And the thing is that we often have quick mind ideas of how we could go, you know. Let's pay a restoration payment, you know, the German government just paid to Namibia for the genocide that happened in Namibia, paid them some money. But if it's not deeply, deeply connected to a process of melting, of acknowledgement, of recognition, and then the restoration of the systems, of the relationships, needs to grow from the melting of the ice. So there is no absolute, this is the solution. This is how it always is very specific to each field. So in those labs, we could only come so far. And now we've gone into a time of deepening the, the training for the facilitators. So we've had that experience, we've come a certain way, and now we're spending a year on deepening, learning from it, integrating the process of the labs while we're training and the next round of international labs will start next year. We also have regular community calls in the pocket project where people can come to and just learn the basic skills. And we have regular global social witnessing calls, which are um, training our nervous systems to, to become a more embodied response to global events. So this might be like right now, our next call. This is, I mean, we're in July right now. I don't know when this will go live, but 25th July is on the war in Ukraine. And we're working, um, yeah, so we're also, so this is a constant process and we're going to be offering a, a global social witnessing facilitator training for people around the world to spread this 
worldwide because we feel it's a very important um, contribution towards if we receive news through the intellect only our response doesn't meet the places where there has been an impact on the nervous systems on the heart on the body it doesn't solve it so people continue walking with a trauma if we can allow this to really land in our bodies and our hearts the news and we send back an embodied response even as a witnessing capacity um, different things can start happening also different actions might emerge different solutions might emerge from that so this is a, a big part and then we do very concrete collective trauma integration processes like we just did in Germany that was 450 people coming together for three days to look at the current state of the German democracy and the very high level of polarization that has happened and digest some of that or we did a collective trauma integration process after shootings in the US with the um, Colorado University Institute for Violence Prevention to see, you know, what is the roots that these shootings grow from. So we're, you know, we're starting and we're continuing um, individual processes. And then we, yeah, so we have the Collective Trauma um, Summit coming up again this year where we had over 100,000 participants last year, the year before, the year before 50,000. So we now have 200, over 250,000 people who've visited, who've participated, who've grown knowledge. And um, the next one is going to be in September. Um, so that's one way of growing. And we are growing the practice groups and pocket groups. As I said before, pockets of healing, um, meeting pockets of trauma. Um, so we're, we're, I've only stepped in two years ago. So we've been growing in the past two years. Currently have a newsletter list of 80,000, which is not huge. And we're really looking at what is the, what is the right rhythm of growth for this organization? How can we deepen the quality of the practice that we do together in such a way that it becomes a ripple effect that goes out in waves into the world? And I believe a lot is already happening because, again, in this area, as in the field of the Global Ecovillage Network, there are many organizations that are collaborating in this field at the moment. Yeah. So we both can't look into the future you know but if we dare to look into the crystal ball i always say we can't predict the future but we co-create it and we're in very tumultuous times and most likely the next decades will be very challenging or even more challenging but nevertheless um if we put the completely doomsday scenarios aside for a moment what gives you hope and talking about like the ripple effects of, of your work, where do you see this really taking like levers in the overall system? So let's maybe look into five or 10 years into the future and take a positive outlook. That's quite a ask, take a positive outlook. <laughs> you know, I think again, we need to acknowledge the reality of the situation that we're in. And at the moment, it's not looking great, as you said, and we will be facing an intensifying um, array of environmental climate disasters. We are already experiencing this. We will be facing increasing streams of climate refugees, plus other crises, as you said, the war in Ukraine being one of them. Um, so the ask for trauma-informed responses is growing at a 
rapid rate. So we're also currently, we're running the second year of um, trauma-informed leadership training. Where well, last year we had 500 participants, this year we have 500 participants. We have 110 Ukrainians in the Ukraine participating. Um, as an example, and people from around the globe, 67 countries. So that gives me hope. I'm very much into spreading seeds and spreading the knowledge of what are the basics competencies in myself, in the relating, self-sensing, relational sensing, system sensing. If I, as a leader, go into my organization every day, but before I go in and move into communication and action, I take a time for relational sensing and system sensing to actually sense what am I arriving into, what is happening here, my responses will be more appropriate. Simple, not hard to do, but the practice. If I actually, when I send an email, take a moment to relate to the person first, so I don't send a disembodied email or a disembodied message. Simple, I just need to remember, you know, it's like, and it will change everything. It will change the effectiveness of my work, you know. If I am wide awake enough to say, I want to see what is it that's hindering the effectiveness of my community, my organization, my country, I'm going to actually allocate resources to looking at this. You know, my dream would be that every country in its constitution says we will address the restoration of collective trauma in our country. The trauma that has been created and the trauma that we suffered. We will do that. We will constantly work on the restoration of relationship. And, you know, of course, and that people do this consciously for their organizations and their communities. And as the Pocket Project, I see us more growing into a consultancy organization also of being able to offer support for people doing this in their environments. While still, of course, offer, offering a lot of practice grounds and a lot of, um, you know, we'll come in and support you with a collective trauma integration process. So. All of that coming together, um, my dream is that in all our co conferences, you know, I'm speaking about last year, we went to the COP26 conference in Glasgow. I've been at the COP conferences representing the Global Ecovillage Network for the past 12 years. So went to COP26 with the Pocket Project for the first time, and we offered global social witnessing spaces where people from the front lines of climate change could actually share. And we had many people from the, um, the groups from the countries that come into the negotiations um, come to us and say, we have found no place here in this conference where we could speak to this reality, to our concern, our pain, you know, people from Nepal saying, actually, those voices, the people on the ground who are experiencing the floods and the drought and death um, are not in the conference. You know, we now have a stronger voice of the indigenous people, so it comes and it trickles in a bit, but it's you know, my dream is that even at a conference like that, I'm not saying all these people should be able to come, you know, so many people couldn't even get a visa to come to the UK, you know, that should have been there. Their voices need to be heard, but that we find other ways through technology, through Zoom, um, to make voices visible 
so that the global social witnessing presence towards what is happening in the world increases. And then I believe we can take different decisions that are not based on the old, but that really grow from a much deeper understanding, embeddedness in the flow of life, the reality of your nervous system communicating to my nervous system of biodiversity, plant life, bird life, animal life, communicating to my nervous system. And we start realizing that my body is in the planet. I'm part of the planet. I'm actually sensing, I'm able to sense what is happening in this world. We've turned that off. It's part of trauma. You know, trauma lies at the root of climate change. The inaction, the apathy, and the phenomenon of climate change. So my dream is that we melt that. And of course, that um, yeah, that the softening of heart in a way, where we turn towards the young people in the world and we acknowledge that the story that we have told them the deficiency story of human beings is not correct and that they deserve spaces where their nervous systems can relax and they can start meeting themselves more fully and from that place I know that each of us has a very specific task in this world. And I have a deep belief that if each of us was able to fulfill our task fully, live our purpose in this one and precious life fully, there would not be too much to do for all of us together. I believe we could make it. But it's an, it's an act of great love and turning towards instead of turning away. Yeah, and at the moment, still large parts of us need to turn away because it's too intense. So it's a miracle that we're calling for, a grace and a miracle. And I believe we're absolutely able We're absolutely able and it, ah, maybe I just think I have this, maybe I could just read a little phrase from the Tao Te Ching that's just coming to me as Please. I'm saying this. Please, Joshua, any, you know, I don't have anything to add, but being deeply moved, grateful oh. for our conversation, grateful to be of service. And how about we end it with the Tao Te Ching? I really yeah. think this would be a nice move for our conversation. Yeah, beautiful. So this is verse 78 of the Tao Te Ching. And I won't read the whole thing. I'll just read the first six lines or the first eight lines. Nothing in the world is as soft and as yielding as water. Yet for dissolving the hard and inflexible nothing can surpass it. The soft overcomes the hard, the gentle overcomes the rigid. Everyone knows this is true, but few can put it into practice. The soft overcomes the hard, the gentle overcomes the rigid. Yeah, so Thank you for this conversation. And I pray that each of us may start with softness and gentleness towards ourselves and softness and gentleness towards what we meet in the world and the beautiful beings, plants and people that we relate to. Thank you for this work. Thanks, Kosha.